Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're going to get started in just a moment. Um, we are just waiting for people to join the webinar and uh, go ahead and enter the webinar. And then we're going to get started in just a moment. But we appreciate your joining us on time. And again, we are going to just wait while people um, filter into the webinar and then we will get started. Again, just a reminder for those who just joined us, we're just going to give it another minute or so um, while people, because people are still joining the webinar, we are going to get started in just a minute. Um, we are, I do have people who are still joining the webinar and then we will get started. Thank you for your patience and thank you for joining us on time. We just got a question and um, the question is, will we get the slides plus a link to the recording? And yes, you will receive the slides plus a link to today's webinar recording. Um, another follow-up question, will you receive a transcript of the meeting? Um, you actually, next to the recording, receive the notes that, um, that you are searchable. Um, so you do receive a searchable transcript of the meeting, which is right next to the recording. We have a few more people who are still joining us. So we're just going to wait for a couple more people and then we'll get started. Again, thank you so much for joining us on time. We do have a lot of content to get through today. So uh, we do appreciate your joining us on time and we are about to get started. Oops. Okay. <laughs> thank you for joining us for today's Optimizing Your PPP Loan webinar. We will get started now. So for today's webinar, you are in listen-only mode, meaning that your audio is on mute. We do recommend that you maximize your Zoom window for an optimal experience. Um, for today's webinar, we do ask that you use Q&A to submit your questions. The Q&A feature is at the bottom of your Zoom window. 
And yes, materials will be sent to you after the webinar, and that will include the slides as well as a recording of the webinar. And then in advance of the webinar, we sent you a glossary of terms. We hope that you all received that. For those of you who joined, la who registered last minute, I know you received those um, last minute. So we hope you did get a chance to uh, look at those. We will be using those terms and we will be referencing them, but we will uh, talk a little bit about them. So uh, you will not be totally lost. So with that, I'll turn things over to Carolyn Katz to introduce herself. Thank you, Kendra. Hi, my name is Carolyn Katz. Um, I worked as a banker for many years. I worked in VC as an investor. Uh, I've worked as an advisor for many companies from very small startups to very large public multinational companies, um, advising them on finance and strategy. Uh, and I actually started my own company, raised funding for that. So I have a lot of funding experience from both sides of the table. I've been with SCORE for about three years. Uh, working on financial strategy, business planning, forecasting, uh, and funding. And when coronavirus first hit, we put together a team of SCORE mentors with finance experience. Um, and Aida Kala, who's going to speak second, is part of that team. Um, we've been spending an awful lot of time going through the various funding options that are available for um, people in need, uh, which is many of us these days. And uh, we realized through doing that, that there are many, many questions about the PPP. Um, understandably, uh, it's very confusing. And so we tried, we thought we would put together this webinar to demystify it. This, hopefully what we're gonna do is not just tell you do this, do that, but try to explain what the objectives were, how things changed, how we got to where we are today, what you need to do to be prepared. And then in the second half, Aida is gonna take you through the actual application so you're ready to go. Okay, but before we get started, uh, we wanted to take a quick poll just to see um, who's in the audience and um, what's going on. So Kendra, if you wanna run the poll. Okay, the first question is pretty simple. Did you receive a PPP loan or not? Um, it's fine, we, have, we hope there's some people who did not, who are considering it, um, but we just wanna know kind of what the mix is. So please answer this question, just click one on your screen. Another minute or a few seconds for people to to uh, submit their answers, and then we will close out the poll. And then we have one more question coming up, so keep your pens and pencils ready or your mouse. It looks like most people have submitted their answers, so I'm going to go ahead and close that poll. Okay. And then I'm going to share the results. Okay. Wow. So we have a good mix about seventy percent, three quarters of you did, and a good chunk of you have not. Like I said, that's great. Um, welcome to, to both of you, and hopefully this will be valuable for everyone. And then we have another question. Okay, so please answer as many of these as pertain to you. Um, what do you have questions about? You, you're on this webinar for a reason. Which of these are, are confusing to you? Answer any and all. submitting their responses and um, we're going to give them a few more seconds to do so. And we're not getting any more responses so I'm going to go ahead and close out that poll and then I'm going to share those results. All right. So it looks like, wow, okay, the forgiveness rules, almost there. there's, there's one or two people there who um, understand the forgiveness rules. Congratulations to you. I'm not sure I would put myself in that category. So that's uh, good to know. Um, but it's, we actually have questions on everything. That's great. We're gonna cover all of these topics. Um, and if I can say one thing, do not be surprised that you have so many questions. Uh, I think one thing that surprised us as we've been running this team is that people come in with questions and they're kind of apologetic about it. Like, I just, I'm sorry, but I just don't understand this one thing. 
if you take nothing else away from this webinar, please understand that this stuff is really complicated. There's two things going on. One thing is, this is a kind of a program that we've never had before. Um, the US government has never done it. They designed it in a hurry. Um, nobody who's administering it, whether it's the SBA or the Treasury or the individual banks has ever done anything like this. And certainly all of us, the borrowers, have never done anything like it. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is it's actually almost everything about the PPP sounds really simple. You can digest it into a sentence or two. It's a loan based on your payroll. And if you spend it appropriately, it'll get forgiven. Look, I just explained the whole thing in a sentence, right? Behind that sentence is an awful lot of complexity. Uh, so it's not you, it's the PPP. And we're gonna try to explain to you uh, what's going on and help you walk through it. Um, and to do that, we are gonna actually backtrack a little bit because if we just jumped right into the application and said, you know, fill in line nine with this number, I think everybody would be more confused. Um, what we're going to try to do is explain a little bit about how we got here. So, um, our goals for the day are to really, as I said, we may start with stuff that you already know. Um, we're going to start by explaining how the PPP has gone through several gyrations. It's changed. It's, there's been amendments to it. Um, how did all of that happen? Um, where do we stand now? Um, what do you, what's going to go on with the loan? And then lastly, what can you do now? And this is really important. There are things that you can do now to be prepared, to have your documentation ready, and importantly, without killing yourself and without doing a ton of, of mathematics, I think there are things you can do, things you can look at in your business to see maybe there are small tweaks you can make now that will improve your forgiveness down the line. Okay. So we're going to start with get to know your PPP. Um, how did we get here? Um, we're going to talk about the forgiveness concepts. And I'm going to talk sort of big picture. Aida is going to take you through the details. Um, we're also going to talk about what happens if it's not forgiven. There's an awful lot of concern out there about forgiveness, 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 um, that I think makes people nervous about the part not forgiven. Um, the bottom line here, the cliff notes is, it's not that bad, but we'll explain that. Then what do you need to know? What's gonna actually happen? You know, we're talking a lot about forgiveness, but how does it get done? And then what you can be doing now. Okay, so the PPP, no, that's fine, go to the next slide, sorry. PPP, as I said, is very simple if we explain it on the basics. It was ex as part of the, designed as part of the CARES Act. And the idea was it was going to be a simple loan. You didn't have to explain your whole business and your whole financial history. Um, they were just going to take 10 weeks of your payroll, give you that amount of money, and as long as you spent it on payroll, rent, mortgage, and utilities, you'd get it forgiven. Simple, right? Well, it wasn't quite that simple. Um, first of all, it was done in a hurry when coronavirus first hit and, and um, cities started going into lockdown and Congress wanted to act fast. And it really was an admirable, it is an admirable program. Um, it's totally understandable that it's become as confusing as it is, uh, but it is confusing. But it's, it's hard to even remember March. But if you can remember that far back, you know, all we thought was we had to stay home for two weeks, flatten the curve, and business was going to bounce back. So that's what the PPP was originally designed for. The idea was during those two weeks, they didn't want businesses shut. They didn't want people laid off. They wanted everybody to be ready to come back and start up the economy again. Well, a couple things, though, didn't work. Of course, that wasn't the scenario that we faced. Um, and so a couple things happened. First of all, businesses couldn't meet their spending targets. Um, in, you had 10 weeks, originally it was eight weeks to spend the PPP. You'd been given 10 weeks of payroll. Um, so if you'd laid off any staff, you couldn't spend it on payroll. And you were, at the same time, you were penalized if you spent that excess on other spending. 
And then, so that was the initial problem. Then as the lockdown actually continued, we had more problems. Um, people who'd started spending on time had used up their funding. Um, there were also problems where you were effectively double penalized. So if you laid off some staff, you couldn't spend the um, PPP funds on payroll in time. And there was another uh, calculation that hit you doubly for having reduced headcount. And if you wanted to rehire staff, the lockdown was continuing. There were um, still health and, and um, all sorts of restrictions in place. You couldn't rehire the staff sometimes if you wanted to. So there were a lot of issues. So in response, in mid-June, the um, Congress passed the Payroll Protection Flexibility Act. Um, or Payroll Protection Plan Flexibility Act, PPPFA, it did a couple of things. And all of these are important. People tend to focus on the first two, um, which are very important, extending the amount of time you had to spend the money and reducing the percentage that needed to be spent on payroll. Um, they also gave you longer to rehire or restore staff. Um, the loan itself, there's some tweaks to the loan, which we'll talk about, that make it more affordable to repay any amounts that aren't forgiven. Um, and it did things to limit that double penalty we talked about. It also created a new simpler application. That doesn't mean it's that simple, but it's simpler. Um, it created a new safe harbor for regulatory purposes, which we'll talk about as well. And then separately, when the PPP was just about to expire on June 30th, uh, in a separate act, Congress extended to August 8th. For, so for all of you who are on the phone who don't have a PPP yet, there is still time. Um, after you get off this webinar, you'll probably want to get started applying if you're interested, because it does expire at the end of next week. But there's time and there's money, and you hopefully will want to do it, or you may very well want to do it after we talk a bit more. OK, so what does this mean? you are much more likely to get a greater portion of your PPP forgiven than you were originally. Um, it may, you, as I said, it's easier to meet the spending targets in 24 weeks. You're less likely to face a penalty for staff cuts. It's easier to file. And the longer maturity and the deferral period, which we'll talk about, make it easier to repay any amounts that aren't forgiven. Also, this easy application. Um, it's easy. I want to clarify one thing right now. It's easy in that it's easier to fill out. But a lot more of the responsibility, therefore, rests on you, the borrower, to understand what's going on because a lot of it is that you have to attest this is true. Um, so it's really, that's why. Um, Please stick with us. We're going to talk about all these concepts, and IED is going to explain them um, because what makes it easier is you don't have to do a lot of calculations, but you still have to be able to say, This is true. This is true about my business. So, if you meet any of these three criteria, the first one's pretty simple. If you have no employees that you know, you can meet this, you can um, file the easy application. If you know that you have not changed your headcount and you have not cut anyone's salary or hourly wages, you're also good to go. And I'm going to make a little aside here. Um, they, the application makes a difference between headcount and hourly wages. So if you have an hourly employee whose salary, whose pay is down because you cut their hours, that's different. But if you cut their hourly wages, if they were at $15 an hour and you moved them to 12, that's a wage cut. So it's one of the many things that's complicated about this, but there's a difference between wages and the hours work. And then lastly, and this is, was the new addition in the PPPFA. If you were unable to maintain headcount because you were complying with the directives of Health and Human Services, the CDC, or OSHA, um, and you still maintain wages and salaries, you also can file that form easy. So, this makes it easier to file, but as I said, important to understand what the rules are. And that's what we're going to talk about in this webinar. Okay, 
There are, I mentioned the differences in wages. There are a number of key terms that we're going to talk about in the course of this webinar. They were all defined on that um, sheet that was sent out to you ahead of the webinar. If you have that handy, that's great. If not, please refer to it. Um, AIDA is going to define these in the second part, the way they're defined in the application, but let's just talk conceptually. Covered period is the amount of time you have to spend the money um, to be eligible for forgiveness. It generally starts, the, it always starts the day that you receive the loan. Um, it, for most people, it's going to continue for 24 weeks. Those who got a loan before June 15th can choose eight weeks, but most people will choose 24. FTE is actually a standard acronym. It stands for full-time equivalency. It's basically a way of comparing your headcount and your hours worked, even if your employees and their schedules change. So you lost one person and you place them with two part-timers, or you have one person who cut their hours and another one who increased it. That can be very complicated. FTE makes it easier to compare different periods of time with different employees. And safe harbor means um, a chance to be exempt from things that otherwise would have impaired forgiveness. So you cut headcount, you cut salaries, but if you restore them by a certain date, which is usually the end of the year, you can be forgiven. That's a safe harbor. Also, a really important thing. What we saw for all of you who lived through the original PPP application, it changed a lot. There were constant clarifications. I'm not sure, but I think there were something like 50 we're up to um, that the Treasury issued explaining things that they hadn't quite got around to in the original application. And I would I am very sure that we will see the same thing with the forgiveness application. We haven't seen it yet because most there hasn't been a lot of applying for forgiveness yet, but there are going to be, I'm almost certain there are going to be adjustments to the application. Um, this, everything that we're saying today is based on the application that came out on June 16th. If you are saving your notes, if you are saving this um, recording for later and you're looking this in August or September or October, please refer back. Make sure that you have all the changes. We have a weekly, a bi-weekly newsletter um, that come, if you're on the SCORE NYC mailing list, you should be getting it. We, we try to cover any major changes um, on our website, scorenyc.org. We also, right on the homepage, we have a link to major um, information. So hopefully you can use those and other things to stay up to speed, but understand that things will change. The last thing, and Aida will cover this, is um, when we talk about covered period, for payroll only, you have a chance to shift that by a little bit. That's really to make it easier for you to document your payroll. But right now, when I say covered period, I mean either the covered period or this alternative covered period. Okay, and with that, we move to forgiveness. So, um, we're going to take the second poll. Um, from based on what you know now, how much of your PPP do you think will be forgiven? Just your best guess. Nobody's holding you to this. So just choose one, please. And for those of you who didn't get the PPP yet, go ahead and, and guess anyhow. But there's no harm. No right answers. So we just <laughs> That's right. We just want to see what you what what people are thinking right now. We're just waiting for a few more votes to come in. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close those polls. I'm going to share the results. Okay, great. So a little over half think that. Um, all of their loan will be forgiven, and another 17% think um, that more than half will be forgiven, and everyone else is pretty confused. So that's great. Um, that's probably pretty fair, and hopefully we will do something to help that 28, 30% at the, um, without an idea um, clarify. But there, you, there's no reason that you need to know this right now. We just wanted to get a sense of it. 
Okay, so as we move into forgiveness, um, again, these are simple sounding concepts, but each one is quite complex. So if you don't get it, if you don't even get it after we explain it, don't worry. Um, hopefully you'll feel a little more confident about it. I'm gonna explain the concepts here and how we got here. Aida's gonna take you through the calculations. Um, the, it's pretty simple, again, sounds simple. Um, you spend your money during that covered period of 24 weeks, unless you choose eight, on payroll, rent, mortgage interest and utilities and 60% of the amount forgiven has to be spent on payroll. Um, salaries, and hourly, salaries and hourly wages have to be at least 75% of pre-crisis levels. Headcount has to stay where it was before the crisis. Um, both of those things can be restored by year end using the safe harbor. And then just one thing that we wanted to mention, which we threw onto this slide, if you also received an idle advance, that will be counted against your forgiven. You can't your forgiveness. You can't get the full amount of PPP plus your idle advance forgiven. Um, but that's a separate issue. If you have questions, ask us. Okay, so here's a few things that confuse people, and this one's really confusing. Sixty percent of the forgiven amount must be spent on payroll. That doesn't mean that 60% of the PPP can be spent on payroll and therefore 40% of the PPP can be spent on rent and utilities. Um, as Aida will explain, you calculate your payroll spending and then you end up dividing by 60%. I know that's confusing, so we're gonna show you some examples. Okay, so here we have a PPP that's uh, $50,000. So. My 60% would be 30,000, 40% is 20,000. In example one, I spend it exactly on target. Fine, 30,000 payroll, 20,000 non-payroll, the whole thing gets forgiven. But if I, if I shift $5,000 of the spending, um, you will see at the bottom that my forgiveness amount actually redu is reduced by $8,300 because of that division by 60%. And then in the last most extreme example, if I spent it all on non-payroll, again, it doesn't mean that I get 20,000 automatically forgiven. I actually get none of it forgiven. That's fine. I will talk about what happens if it's not forgiven. If that is the right thing for your business, you may very well want to do that. Um, do not twist yourself into pretzels just to get the loan forgiven but understand the way this works. Because I, I hear a lot of people say, 60% of your PPP can be spent on payroll, 40% on non-payroll. That's not true. Just understand what's gonna happen. The FTE reduction sim similarly sounds very simple. Um, did you, is your head count the same as it was before the crisis or did you, and if it wasn't, did you restore it by the end of the year? Simple, right? But again, lots and lots of complexity. This is probably the most complex part of the loan. First of all, how do you measure head count? We talked a little bit about FTE. Um, even that has, Aida will explain, has two different ways of calculating it. Um, what do you compare it to? Um, last year is the most obvious comparison, but what if your business is changing a lot? You were ramping up quickly, uh, your new business, you were slowing down. Well, you can also compare to the beginning of the year. And if you're a seasonal business, you have another choice for that. Again, it's, it's to help you, it's to make it give you the most fair comparison period, but it adds complexity. We have this whole safe harbor issue, which is complex. And then we have exemptions, uh, which we'll talk about. So staffing levels, well, again, was your headcount reduced compared, ref, compared to the reference period? You have the safe harbor, but you also have other exceptions. And so some of these things, um, Aida will talk about this, but if things happen with your employees, please keep records. Make sure you have an email. Email's probably better, if not a text that you've taken a screenshot of, um, but keep track of what's going on with your employees because there are exceptions. If you offer to rehire somebody or to restore hours that were cut and they refuse, 
that doesn't count against you. If they were fired for cause, if they resigned voluntarily or voluntarily requested to work fewer hours, again, that won't count against you, but keep that documented. And then the last thing is this new, um, this new safe harbor that I talked about. If you're unable to operate at prior levels due to compliance with governmental guidelines. Now this is in the handout that was sent to you separately. There are a lot of words on this page. And I will start by telling you that I don't know how many hours Aida and myself and the rest of our team have spent on just this paragraph, but it's a lot. And I'm very sure that this is an area that will get further clarification as we talked about. Um, but here's what we know now. Okay, let's start actually um, partway down the page. So if you're, uh, so after this sort of, so at the second sentence, if you're unable to operate at the same level of business activity as before February 15th, due to compliance with requirements or guidance, so that's important. It's not just rules or the governor shut you down, but if there's guidance that was issued by any of these agencies, Health and Human Services, CDC, or OSHA, related to sanitation, social distance, Thing, or any other worker or customer safety requirement related to COVID-19. So that's a very broad category. That's one thing. So it would seem, given everything that we're going through, that this would apply to very, very many businesses. Um, again, there's probably going to be a little clarification. We go back to the beginning of this though. If the borrower in good faith is able to document, I have to tell you, um, between you and me, that means pretty much nothing. But um, so there, there is very little information in the regulations at this point about what kind of documentation is required. Um, so, but that good faith means, I think, if you can really show that you were hurt, um, and in fact, a lot of the documentation is just on your business, that your business is down. Um, so these are all areas that I would expect clarification, but the takeaway here is this is a very broad um, regulation. One other thing to keep in mind, one area where I think, again, I would expect clarification is what if your business couldn't comply with all of this, but you're still um, impacted? So let's say, for example, that you, you do social media marketing for restaurants. Um, you have three people on staff, you always work remotely. So there's nothing about your business that's directly impacted. But of course, your business is still enormously impacted because all of your clients are closed. I don't know. Uh, honestly, I don't think anybody knows. Right now, I would feel that you were um, included in this. I would expect further clarification. But these are the kinds of things I think that we're going to see going forward. Okay, we're going to stop here before we get to forgiveness for to get to the loans and next steps and take a couple questions that were submitted in advance. Thanks. So our first question comes from Sarah. She asks, my business received both the idle and PPP. While it is clear that both loans cannot be used to run payroll for the same period, is it possible to use both to maintain, maintain payroll over different pay periods? I think that's true. Um, as I said, you, you only need to apply for forgiveness uh, for the amount that can be forgiven. Um, so in both rent, utilities, and payroll, um, you only need to include the amount that um, you're only going to get forgiven up to your uh, amount of your PPP. So the idle is used for much broader, um, you have much broader rules on what you can spend the idle on. So once you have exhausted your PPP, you can certainly spend that money on payroll. Um, but you should still document all of your spending during the covered period to submit that to the, um, to the SBA for forgiveness. Thanks, Carolyn. Jerry asks, it's not reasonable for the OIG to investigate every PPP loan for compliance. What will trigger an investigation? <laughs> Okay, well, hopefully Jerry is asking this because um, you want to know uh, 
just what kind of documentation or because you're worried about being investigated, not because anybody is planning to do anything under the table. Um, we absolutely recommend one reason that you're here is that you understand all the regulations and that you comply. Um, even in the short form application, what, some of the things that you're going to attest to is that you understand that you can't lie on the doc, on the application and that it's subject to fines or even imprisonment if you do. So with that caveat, um, they've already clearly demarcated PPPs of more than $2 million and said that all of those will be reviewed. How they'll do that, we still don't know. The SBA itself has no um, investigative powers. Um, they would have to refer it to other agencies. Um, then I think there's also been sort of an informal demarcation at about $150,000. So I would expect that um, loans certainly above two million and probably six figure loans. Um, at the very least, just make sure you have all your documentation in place. I think other things that they're clearly on the lookout for, I'd say just reading between the lines of the documentation, um, they don't want to see, um, Aida is gonna talk about the salary caps for owners. Um, clearly one thing they're concerned about are using these funds to sort of, for self enrichment. Um, and there's two ways just looking at the documentation that they think you're, you may do that. One is to fire your employees and pay yourself. And that's pretty much been um, prohibited by the salary caps. And another one is to, let's say, say, hmm, I don't pay rent now, but why don't I say I'm paying rent to my brother-in-law and I'm going to use some of my PPP for that. That's, there's also restrictions on when your agreements came into place. They have to have been in place before February 15th. So anything that smacks of self-dealing, I think is also going to get um, some scrutiny. Thanks, Carolyn. I just want to let everybody know um, that um, we are going to try to balance the questions that were submitted at the time people registered, as well as the questions that are being submitted live now. So thank you for submitting the questions live now. We are going to have a fairly extensive Q&A at the end of this session. So we're going to take as many of, of, of those as we can live at the end of this session. So please be patient with us. Us. So with that, Carolyn, carry on. Thank you. Okay, so now what happens if it's not forgiven? Okay, in this graphic, I've shown the, the frightened man running from the loan. But again, the takeaway here is that is not the case. This is not a frightening loan. The terms of the loan are, it's 1% interest rate, obviously very low. If you got your PPP after June 5th, you automatically get five years to repay. If you got it beforehand, it's, it will start out as a two-year loan, but it's written very explicitly that that's negotiable and we would recommend that you negotiate. You will have no payment due until the SBA approves the forgiveness amount. I know that that sentence makes no sense. We're going to explain that a little bit later. Um, but what it means is you will not ever owe money on amounts that end up being forgiven. And there's no collateral or personal guarantee. This is something that people tend to brush past, but it's really important because it makes, it gives you more flexibility on this loan. So I said, low interest rate, manageable principal payments. Um, you will not owe any amounts on anything that ends up being forgiven. And the lack of personal guarantee and the collateral means that those are the things that a bank uses to make you pay. Um, first of all, it means that there'll be less repercussions because you don't have personal guarantee. But also, if you run into problems, um, you, this is a much more negotiable loan because basically the bank has many fewer hooks than they typically have to get you to repay. The other thing to remi remember is this is a very low interest loan. That's good for you. It's not so good for the banks. Negotiating with borrowers, tracking down people who can't pay, all of those things are really onerous for the banks. 1% interest on a $50,000 loan is not going to pay the bank to do that. They, again, we can't speak for every lender, we can't speak for every situation, but generally speaking, knowing what we know about banks, and both Aida and I were former bankers, 
given what's in it for the banks, they would love to see this thing get forgiven. That's the most positive for them. But if it's not forgiven, it is in their interest to work with you to make this loan payable and affordable. So it may be, if it's not forgiven, don't worry. It may be a good source of capital. So those of you who don't have a loan, a PPP yet, and you're thinking about it, it may be a good source of funds for your business, even if you can't get it forgiven. So with that said, how do you apply? You're going to apply back. We're going to talk about the SBA's um, forgiveness application, but you are, do not apply to the PPP. You apply to whoever issued your loan. Now, they may have handed it off to some other company, but they'll, they'll make that clear to you. You can either submit the SBA forms or many of the lenders may set up an electronic portal, but the form is gonna be the same. They're gonna use the same calculations that AIDA will take you through. They're gonna use the same schedules. They're gonna require the same documentation. And as we go through, as the application process gets clarified, um, those clarifications will also apply to all the lenders as well. The application process. And this is where I said, I was gonna clarify that crazy sentence about, you, you don't have, owe any interest until the SBA approves the forgiveness amount. You get your paperwork together, submit it to your lender. The lender has 60 days to review and send their verdict to the SBA. And then the SBA has 90 more days to approve that. They're gonna then send the forgiven about, amount back to the lender. The lender's paid off, you're forgiven, end of that part of the story. So that's five months. It can take up to five months from when you hand in your application until the loan is forgiven. This is important too. What's the lender going to do? They are, and this is explicitly in the application, they are going to refute that they got the application and all the necessary documents on payroll and other spending. They're going to confirm that you did the calculations correctly, that you added, subtracted, and divided correctly. And then for everything else, they can rely on what you said. So importantly, going back to that safe harbor for the regulation, if you say that you were unable to restore headcount based on regulation, right now, and we don't know that this will change, we should stay the same, the lender can rely, and I think they will keep this because it's hard for the lender to verify. If you say it's true, the lender will accept that it's true. When to apply? This is confusing. Um, as I said, most people have the 24 week period and are likely to take that. If you got one of the original PPPs and you spent the money on target and you know that you meet the eligible spending and you didn't cut headcount, then you can apply early. In fact, if for some reason now that this downturn is dragging on, you feel that you may need to cut headcount in the future, you may want to do this now. We'll talk about this. You don't have to. Um, but only if you are sure that you met all of the criteria in eight weeks um, and you can't restore, like it won't get any better for you, um, then you may want to take advantage of that eight-week period. What happens if you don't want to do eight weeks, but you really um, are ready, you've spent all your money before 24 weeks. There are no restrictions at all. You, there's nothing to stop you, at least in the application itself, from applying early. Um, your lender may not accept it. We don't know, that will be up to the lender. Um, the question will be the safe harbor. If you cut wages or headcount, it's not clear. You, most people will still be reliant on that year-end safe harbor. And so if it's not year-end yet, you may have difficulty um, proving that. Um, and if you've restored early, there isn't right now in the regulation a way to say, okay, well, on October 15th, I restored my headcount. Um, but um, hopefully that will be clarified. Then in, in the rules itself, actually you, have, you only have to file for forgiveness by the maturity date, which is now five years. So you have plenty of time to do it. If you don't file um, within 10 months of when your covered period ends, so you have six months of covered period and 10 more months, then they will start charging you interest. Your deferral period ends, but you do not even then have to necessarily file the application. So our bottom line is get everything prepared. 
there's a good rule anyhow, as you'll see there are some decisions you can make. Be prepared, no necess not necessary to apply early unless for some reason it really works for you. So be prepared. What can you do now? Let's talk a little bit about that. First, determine your cover period. That's easy. You got your PPP on a certain day, 24 weeks later is the end of your um, covered period. Does it make sense to have an alternative period for payroll? Aida is going to talk about this. The simple answer is if you pay payrolls weekly or bi-weekly and your pay period doesn't happen to start exactly on the day that you got your PPP loan, you'll probably want to use an alternative period. It's just going to be easier for you. Um, and there may be, even if you don't use those kinds of pay periods, if you use twice a month or once a month, it still may be easier. Um, but just take a look at that. That's just something that's easy to do. Understand these key forgiveness terms, headcount, salary and wage reductions, safe harbor, um, and figure out what's right for you. Take a look at the two FTE calculations that IE is going to talk about. Do a simple back of the envelope calculation, see which one is going to work better for you. Um, and do a little thinking too, and maybe collect some documentation on your reference period, because you're going to need to refer, you're going to need to compare your headcount now to one of these prior periods. Just make sure you have that documentation together. Going forward, you want to make sure that you are tracking not only your payroll spending, but hours worked and headcount. If you use a payroll processor, most of them are pretty PPP savvy at this point. Call them, email them, talk to them, figure out what documentation they have because they may have a lot of it for you, but familiarize yourself with it, know what you've got. If any employees left, if you fired anyone, if you made these offers that weren't accepted, keep track of that, make sure you have all of your documentation. And if you did reduce anybody's salary or their hourly wage by more than 25%, just keep, keep an eye on that. Take a look at it. It may make sense to restore it, if not now, by the end of the year. The cost to you of you know, spending a little bit more on hourly wage may make sense um, if it gets more of your loan forgiven. And lastly, don't stop there. Um, it's really important for all small businesses to really keep track of their funding. This is a really great chance to get on top of that. If you can, keep your PPP funds in a separate bank account. That will make it just much easier to track what you spent money on and make sure that you've complied. Keep track of all your eligible expenditures besides the payroll, which I talked about, rent, mortgage, utilities. But really, track all of your spending. Understand how this cash from the PPP works within your funding needs. Um, times are tough for all businesses. It's really important that you understand your cash flow. This is a great chance to start honing in on that. It's something all small businesses should be doing anyway. Open questions. This is not open questions for you. This is what do we still have questions about? Um, as I said, expect that there will be revisions to the forgiveness application. We will keep you posted on all of those. Check our newsletter, check our website, um, but this is going to evolving process, there are still many gray areas. Looking at the application, things that we think are gray areas that we would very much expect to be addressed, what happens if you want to apply before the 24 weeks are up? Um, this is a, a minor one, but for those of you who are um, applying for a PPP now or applied after June 30th, right now the final PPP, for the final safe harbor for everyone is the end of the year. But if you apply in August, your six months will go to next February. I don't know if they'll extend the safe harbor. We'll have to see with that. That's a new, um, a new regulation. And then lastly, this governmental guideline, it's very vague language. I would expect some clarification on that. What might come next? Um, two things to keep an eye on, nothing you need to do right now. Um, there is an IRS program called the Employer Retention Tax Credit which gives you up to $5,000 of tax credits, which may actually be funds, you know, they may actually pay you cash into your business. If you keep employees on staff, 
Right now, that is unavailable to people who got the PPP. We don't know what happens when the payroll, when the covered period is done, when the PPP expires. Um, that's something I would expect some clarification on. We will keep you posted. And then lastly, right now, the government is starting this week to debate um, a potential round two of PPP. Right now, and this is very early discussions, um, they, are, they are talking about a second round potentially for people who got a first PPP and have had their, um, their businesses severely impacted. The, the talk is more than, their sales are down more than 50%. We don't know. Again, we'll keep you posted. But if you got that first PPP, there is some potential there'll be a second one. And with that, I will turn it over to Aida. Aida? Yes, I'm here. Could you introduce yourself? Yes, sure. So my name is Aida Kala, and I have been with SCORE a little bit under two years. Um, and as Carolyn mentioned, I am part of the dedicated funding slash finance group within the New York City chapter. Um, I am a, a longtime banker uh, that specialized in corporate finance. And then subsequent to that, I had and still do my own debt restructuring practice uh, where I looked, where I counsel um, companies that need to talk to banks about or rescheduling their debt and how to do so successfully. So coming into, I guess, the nitty gritty, um, you'll notice there's a lot, we did this on purpose, Caroline and myself, there's a lot of repetition because the concepts, as Caroline mentioned, are really, um, they may look, um, as she said, at, on, at face value, they may look simple, but when you actually come to do, to do something with them, they can be very confusing. And I don't know to what extent you guys have been able to get the actual application. It's not just one form. It's like a, a couple of forms. And every single line on one of them refers to a calculation on another. So what we've tried to do here is rather than taking out an application and putting it in front of you and going line by line, which would be impossible, we are, um, focusing on the main calculations so that when you do get to the application, you'll say, aha, uh -huh, I remember that one. I remember that one, hopefully. Okay. So this is going to be a micro view uh, and a repetition to some extent of what Carolyn uh, was saying. So we're going to go over exactly the definition of what a covered period is and the options that you can take. We're going to go through the definition of what is an eligible expense for you to be able to be forgiven the amount of the PPP. We're then going to get to which application to use. There's an easy form and then there's a long form and what it is that you have to comply with to be able to use one versus the other. And then you'll see the easy form doesn't have a lot of calculations. So all the calculations come in when we talk about the long form and we'll be going through that. And at the very end, I'm going to talk about the, the different documents that are involved. And I'm giving you also links to these documents so that you can go to them directly uh, on your own uh, and, and, and try to try to compare what's in the slides when you get them with what the documents are actually asking for. Okay, so let's talk about the covered periods. So you now have, you didn't before, as Carolyn said, when PPP first came out, uh, and it came out early, I believe it came out in April sometime, you only had one covered period. And that was an eight week period from the day that you received the funds under PPP. That has now changed. So as of June 16th, well actually it's June, June 5 when they changed things, but the actual application is dated June 16. And again, I, I wanna stress the application is dated June 16. So uh, who knows? That application, which we're covering right now, most likely I would think 80% of it, if not 90% of it, will remain the same. But it, it is likely, as, as things change, and they might, that some parts of it will be tweaked. But the general concepts, I, I doubt, will change. So now you have two options. You can choose the 24-week period, beginning the day that you receive the funds. So for example, you receive the funds on April 20th, uh, your covered period is April 20th to October 4th. 
the cover period cannot extend beyond December 31st, 2020. At least for now, that is what's in place. If you're a borrower that applied early and received the funds early, uh, then you can, you have the option, uh, if you've received it before the June 5th date that I mentioned, you do definitely have the option to elect an eight week period. You, do, you are not bound or forced to use the 24, especially if you receive the funds early and you've already spent them, there's no point in waiting unless there could be some things going on which will definitely, and I'll point them out, be in your favor to wait, okay? But if you, if you listen to this webinar and see all the requirements and you believe that you can th therefore be forgiven, there's no, need, no reason to, to take advantage of the 24 week. But if you've laid off people or if you've reduced wages um, and you've spent everything, but, you've, but you still have those situations where you have less, uh, uh, less head count, lower wages, then you probably do want to take the 24 uh, week period because then you can take advantage of safe harbor rules that basically say, as long as you restore these levels by December 31st, you're forgiven. All right, now there's an, alter the, there's an alternative payroll covered period, which is, this is only applying to payroll. So as I go through all this, when we talk about the, 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 um, the choice, this choice only applies to payroll spending. Instead of, uh, uh, instead of the period starting on the day that you actually receive the money, you, the, it can start on your next payroll date. If you have biweekly or monthly payroll dates, you can actually wait for the meter to start running. So as an example, if you receive it on Monday the 20th, but you decide to use APCP um, and you have a payroll week that uh, starts from Sunday through Saturday, you can actually begin that period on April 26. Okay, let's go through eligible expenses. All right. So payroll costs, obviously, that's a very important category in PPP. Very important category, again. It must be at least 60% of, of the forgiveness amount. Um, and again, we're gonna go through the forgiveness amount and see what that means. Employees must be U.S. residents. Okay. Non-payroll costs, rent, utilities, mortgage interest payments, not principal. But if you have interest payments, yes, you can use the money for that. Non-payroll needs to be for services that were in place prior to February the 15th. So you can't now come out and rent something new or have electricity that you didn't have or take out a mortgage that you didn't have. All of that, you can't service it with any of the money that you get from PPP. Carolyn mentioned this. This is very, very uh, helpful in my opinion. Uh, how do you start? If you have not, if you have taken the 20, if you've decided that you want the 24 uh, period and you, you're still, uh, you're still uh, uh, spending money and how do you keep track of it? I think the best way, if possible, is to open a specific bank account and put the PP funds in there. Now, if you can't get your expenses out of the same account so that you have in one account exactly what you got and what you're spending, because sometimes you have automatic payments with, with, uh, with uh, suppliers or with utilities that go to your account, you don't wanna change that, that's fine. But then what you wanna do is as soon as you make that payment, Take that money out of the account in which the PPP funds are and transfer them. Because you do want to have a track in one account of what came in from PPP and what went out. All right. Another change, which is a good change that happened with the new application, is that you, 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 we are now going to distinguish between the concepts of actually paid or incurred. And this does apply to both payroll and non-payroll. So it's considered incurred for payroll, for example, when earned but not necessarily paid. Um, it's not, so considered paid is when you actually send out the check uh, whenever you do that by the next regular pay date or, what, or whatever. But, you, but I will show you in the next slide uh, a, an example of that. On the non-payroll side, you can also count it um, if it's incurred but not yet paid. 
So utility bills cover usage in one month, but paid in the next month. So let's see, let's assume you come to December, right? And you want to, and you know that that's the deadline date for the covered period. And you get a bill for your electricity in January, which is beyond December. Can you still include it? Yes, because it has to cover a period within uh, the date where December is. Okay. Example for payroll. Your coverage period ends on 12 31 2020. As of that date, employees have earned their salary for the whole month of December, but the next payroll date is not until January 7. Can you include these payroll expenses even though the employees will not be paid until after the deadline date? The answer is yes. All right, so what is payroll, all right? I've gotten already a number of questions in the chat room um, because people see the word payroll and they panic because they say, wait a minute, I don't have payroll. I'm my own, my, I have a, my own business. I'm a sole proprietor. Uh, I don't have payroll. Does that mean that immediately I don't qualify? No, the answer is, first of all, there are employees and we're gonna be discussing how you, how you do the payroll count for them. And then there's your own compensation. So just because you don't have employees doesn't mean that the word payroll should um, concern you or, or make you panic in any, any way. So let's now go into what the limitations are, both for employees and for yourself. Your, your, the annual salary of any employee or yourself, and when I say salary for yourself, I'm going to get into what that means, cannot be more than $100,000 per annum. Your employee compensation is evidenced by a W-2 form in the form of salary, wages, commissions, and tips. Now, I would like to stress, employee does not mean independent contractor. Independent contractors get a 1099 form. They are not, you are not eligible to use PP funds to pay your independent contractors. However, the independent contractors themselves can apply and are eligible to get their own PPP. But anything that you've spent and it went to an independent contractor, you cannot use in the forgiveness application. So let's come to the owner compensation, all right? Let's assume that you are an independent contractor, that's an owner, right, of your own business or sole proprietor. Uh, how do you, what is it that you are going to put down uh, as the basis by which uh, you are asking for forgiveness, okay? So if you're an individual, you usually file uh, a Schedule C, okay? Which is part of your tax returns. You've got your revenues minus your expenses, and then you come down to a net income number, okay? That net income number is an annual number. So you will, you will um, that doesn't mean that you are going to be able to qualify for the whole amount because I'm gonna go into the next slides and show what the limits on that are. If you are in a partnership, then as you know, you anyway have to file a K-1 for partners and it's the same concept. Okay, so owner compensation, self-employed or partner. It's the lesser of two and a half months worth of 2019 compensation or 20,833 for a 24 week coverage period or 15,385 for an eight week coverage period. This is the maximum amount that you can record. So if you're a sole proprietor, don't have any payroll, don't have anything, you don't even have, I know this is not realistic, you don't even have rent, utilities, nothing. The only thing you have is you're probably an online person and you don't have any expenses other than what you want to get out of the business for yourself. If you choose the 24 week coverage period, you're not going to be able to be eligible for more than 20,833. That's in a case where it's only you're paying yourself and there's nothing else. Same thing for the eight week coverage period. Employee compensation. All right, that's also based off the, uh, what they're doing is they're taking the $100,000 per annum and they are prorating it over the, over the coverage periods. So you cannot 
compensate or you can if you want to, but it won't count. But when you take your payroll calculations for an employee with a capital E, the maximum amount that you can give that employee as part of the PPP forgiveness calculation is the 46,154 and then the 15,000 for the eight week coverage period. Okay, so what does, what does payroll actually include? Obviously, it, it, it included the, 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 the compensation, the paid compensation that we talked about, but payroll includes other items, not just paid compensation. So it includes vacation, family, medical leave, or other sick wages. It includes allowance for separation or dismissal. It includes health care coverage and benefits, and it includes local taxes assessed on employee compensation. So those are definitely includable. Okay. All right. Take a deep breath. Have you had enough details or, or are you ready to have more? We're gonna take three questions here, Aida. And the first is, do you need to keep the same employees or is it okay to replace with different individuals when counting payroll? Definitely, you do not have to keep the same. It's the head count that matters. Okay, can a business include independent contractor compensation when calculating payroll? No. Again, no, no, unless you are the independent contractor and you're the one applying for PPP. And what form needs to be provided for independent contractors for tax filing purposes? The 1099. Okay, great, let's go ahead and move on. Okay, so now we come to the real nitty gritty here, okay? So be patient with me. Um, I don't know if this is pleasant or not, but I guess you guys will, will decide so after you hear me talk. So let's start. There is an easy form. I don't know what your banks have given you or not given you, but this, these are for the record, the, the two available uh, applications. One is the easy form, okay? So the easy form is if you meet any one of the following criteria, you're a sole proprietor, independent contractor, self-employed, what have you, and you have no employees or you do have employees, you're a sole proprietor, everything, but you do have employees, you have not reduced the headcount as measured by FTE, which we're gonna go into in detail, and have not cut salaries or hourly wages by more than 25%. And then the last one is a governmental one, because what it basically says is, irrespective of whether you had to reduce headcount um, or reduce uh, wages to some extent, you may still be eligible to use the easy form. And that is because your business had to comply with government regulations related to COVID, and therefore you could not function at that same level. Uh, but at the same time, you might have reduced your FTE, which is your employee headcount, but your hourly wages could not have been reduced or your salaries by more than 25%. So what does it mean? You're a lucky person and you can do the easy form. And you're not going to get cross-eyed by looking at the long form and a myriad of worksheets and schedules that go with it. It's a very simple calculation. Let's go back first for a minute to the previous slide. So it's, a pay, it's your payroll cost, which we discussed, your rent, your utilities, and your mortgage interest. That's your total spend. Does that mean that's the amount? Not necessarily, because the way the forgiven amount works, it's the lesser of your spend, total spend. You may have spent more than the PPP loan. So it's the lesser of that, the PPP amount, and then the, the, the payroll amount divided by 0.60. So we will be going through these concepts in examples, but this is really a very simple calculation as long as you understand the definitions and the categories. Okay, again, both for the long form and the short form, I would stress that before you sign and send that on to your bank, you read very carefully the certifications that they're asking you to make. Read every single line and be comfortable that when you sign that form, you're comfortable certifying and there are a lot of different certifications there. Okay, so who does the long form? All right, obviously, if you don't meet any of the requirements of the easy form, then you have no choice. Have you reduced salaries or hourly employee compensation by more than 25%? Or have you reduced headcount? 
both in comparison to pre-crisis reference periods, which we, which we will be discussing. So while, you, while you're still having to fill out the long form, because you didn't qualify for the easy form, that does not necessarily mean that you're not going to be forgiven. Because there are, as Carolyn mentioned, certain exemptions and certain safe harbor rules, which we will go through, that if you meet them, then no matter what your calculations are, they'll be thrown out and you will be forgiven. Okay, so another question. If one does not qualify exactly for the easy form, but knows that they will qualify for FTE exemptions and safe harbor, despite reduction in headcount head and salary slash hourly wages by more than 25%, why do they still have to go through the whole long form? They have to go through the very long form because they do have to show uh, if in order for them in order for them to qualify for the safe harbor and the exemptions, they have to go through calculations which were not given in the easy form. Those calculations are part of the FT, uh, are part of the long form, and you go through them line by line and you show in those documents why you qualify for the exemptions. This is why you still have to do the long form. Thanks. Okay. So coming to the long form forgiveness application calculations. Here we go. So what is the forgiveness amount? Everybody keeps obviously talking about forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. What, what is the amount? It is the lesser of a modified amount, a PP amount, or the payroll cost divided by 0.60. Now, the second two don't need explaining, but the first one does, which takes us to what is a modified amount. Okay. So this is how you arrive at a modified amount. You take your salary and wage reductions and if they exceed 25% compared to pre-crisis levels, then you have to make a calculation and see what's gonna go on for your forgiveness amount, which we will do in a minute. Unless you restore, which, which is a safe harbor, unless you restore these levels by December 31st. If you have headcount reductions compared to pre-crisis levels, uh, no adjustments need to be made if certain exemptions and our safe harbor conditions are met. Again, we will go through that. Okay, salary wage reduction. Now think about things in, it, always in two categories. One is your head count and how you calculate that. And the other is your actual salary slash wages that you're giving out. So if you start with the salary slash wage calculation, what you basically do is you, you, you are going to compare what happened with that. If, you, if you're gonna choose a reference period, actually you don't choose it, this is one where you don't choose, it's given to you. You're given a reference period of January the 1st to March 31st. And you look at the salary calculation there and you compare it to what you've done now during the covered period, whether it be an eight week period or a 24 week period. If it's not, if the reduction is not more than 25%, then that's it. You're, you're, you don't have an issue here at all. If it, is, if it is more, you're going to have to, in the calculations, take the excess of your reductions over the 25%, and that amount can go towards reducing your favorable, your forgiveness amount. Again, unless you do not restore by December 31st. So what the formula is pretty, uh, it, we're not gonna go through the formula here because it's pretty, uh, it's actually not hard, but it's involved. So you have to really concentrate when you go from line to line. But the concept basically is, is you calculate the weekly, redu you take the reduction, you calculate it on a weekly basis. And once you calculate it on a weekly basis, you multiply it either by the 24 period or eight period. And that's how you come up with the, the amount which could, which could go towards reducing your forgiveness. Maybe, maybe not, depending on all the safe harbor and exemption uh, that we've been talking about and we will further elaborate on. Okay, 
So for headcount, I am going to go into more detail here about how you calculate it. They use a concept for the headcount reduction of something called FTE. It's basically the average full-time equivalency during either the covered period or the alternative payroll covered period. Again, remember the alternative payroll covered period is only for payroll. So you have two ways. You, have, you either actually take for each employee the average number of hours paid per week and you divide it by 40 and you round to the nearest tenth. And the maximum for each employee is, will be capped at one. The simple way, which is much simpler than the above, which I suggest, is you use basically anybody who, who worked 40 hours or more per week gets a one, and anybody who didn't gets a 0.5. And these numbers you're going to see because we're going to go through the actual calculations in a, in, a, in a subsequent slide so you understand how these numbers fit in. Okay, so, so the first, so the, the, what you now need to do is the following. You're using the same method that you used in step one, which is for your actual spend. And you're gonna choose here, they're giving you a choice of a reference period, either the 15th of February to the 30th of June of 2019 versus January to February 29 of this year. Okay. In the case of seasonal employers, you also have a, a, a different ways of calculating the reference period. This step is not needed if you meet the FTE safe harbor rules. And you'll see why in a minute. Okay. Step three is to come up with something called the FTE quotient. The FTE quotient is calculated by dividing the first calculation you made by the second calculation, which is your actual FTE during the covered period divided by the FTE you come up with for the reference period. The FTE quotient cannot exceed one, but you'd love it to be one because if it's one, then your FTE is gonna be forgiven, whatever happened. You're gonna use that one and you'll see in a minute how that one is good. If you have it as less than one, and if you do not meet safe harbor rules, that lower number is gonna is going affect your forgiveness calculation. Okay. All right, now we come up to these safe harbor rules and you know, what are they, okay? So safe harbor one is basically the government one. What it's saying to you is on the FTE side in particular, if, you, if your business activity between February and the end of the coverage period could not continue at the same level because you were complying with all the rules of OSHA and, and the CDC related to COVID, you're gonna to have to certify that and you're going to possibly have to show documentation about that. Well, that is something that will definitely be taken into consideration and you could be forgiven. Safe Harbor 2, you reduced the headcount, but you restored it by December 31st. If either applies, then FTE quotient again is set at one. FTE for the covered period has to be calculated, but comparison with reference period, not necessary. Let's keep going. Okay. All right. So we have a lot of concepts here. And how do we apply these concepts to actual numbers? Because I think when you see the numbers themselves, hopefully it'll become more clear. So I've chosen the simple method here. So what I've done is I have three employees. Two of them are salaried, that's why the S is there, and one of them is hourly wages. So I take, I chose a, a reference period. I don't remember which one, but I chose a reference period that you can choose, okay? And, and for that reference period, on a weekly basis, employee one was doing basically 40 hours. Same thing with employee two, and even the hourly person was the same. So therefore, what is the FTE for the reference period? It's the, you take 40 and you divide it by 40. If it was 60, you'd still divide it by 40. So you get one. Then you come to your actual spend during the coverage period. Same thing, you put in whatever it is that they, the hours that they worked. So for employee one, they worked 40 hours in the reference period. They still worked 40 hours during the covered period. 40 divided by 40 is one. However, when you come to two and three, 
their level went down. The number of hours that they worked went down. So because it was less than 40, we just used 0.5. And so it's really just a two in terms of the addition, whereas in reference period three, uh, reference period you had three. So your FTE quotient is two divided by three, which is equal to 0.67. This is something that has no exemptions, no safe harbor. Let's assume, you know, this is it. You're going to see how this particular quotient in the next examples will reduce your modified amount. Let's go on. Okay. However, you do have exemptions. Okay. And again, you are going to have to go through this long form because the long form has calculations in it, which step by step ask you if you can be exempted from this or not, and you have to check certain boxes. Okay. So, when can you be exempted? Let's say that uh, your headcount has gone down, the number, and one of your employees or several have, have declined an offer to return or restore lost hours. That's fine, but you have to have it in writing. Employees who were fired for cause or voluntarily resigned or requested blah, 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 also, you have to have it in writing. If then if not replaced, remember, if you replace these, these employees, then it's not a problem. You replace them and their, their head count will be counted. But if you did not replace them and these were the conditions, then uh, the, the, the FTE exemption comes in if you have it. So let's see what that means. Okay, so this is the same example we did before, but I'm going to introduce exemptions. I'm going to say that you had two employees, two where one or, or the other of what we just discussed happened, okay? So I'm gonna give a one to each one of these employees because, they, because you can take that one for each because you qualify for the exemption. So now in, in the, the rightmost column, I'm gonna put two in that column, whereas before I only had the two, now I'm adding another two. So now my total, my total headcount calculation is a four. If you compare it to the three, it exceeds one. Your FTE quotient now is one. That's a good thing. So that shows you how the FTE, and this particular thing is in, a work, is in the worksheet that is attached to a Schedule A, and Schedule A is attached to the loan forgiveness calculations but you will see this. This is a live schedule in what you're gonna be filling. All right, so let's now summarize and we will be following with example. Let's summarize what is the forgiveness calculation, All right? Okay, go back, okay. So A is your total spend, your actual total spend, your payroll plus rent plus utilities plus mortgage interest. You're gonna be adjusting that, okay? for any wage reductions. And again, the, the wage reduction is an adjustment only if, again, it's more than 25% compared to the reference levels and you do not qualify in, uh, and you have not, uh, you do not qualify for the safe harbor, which is that by December 31st, you have not restored those levels. So this is, you know, the worst case scenario. Then you take amount B, and you apply the FTE quotient to arrive at the modified amount, okay? This is where the FTE quotient is important because if the FTE quotient is one, then you're just gonna multiply that B by that one and you get the modified amount. If it's less than one, then you are applying a less than one ratio, which will bring down your modified amount. So you get to your modified amount, you have your PPP loan amount, and then you have your payroll costs divided by 0.60. And uh, the, the forgiveness amount is the lesser of those three. Okay, so this is a live example, all right? This is an example where you do not have uh, safe harbor, you have not met any, anything to do with safe harbor. So this is again, a worst case scenario. So your payroll costs were 125,000, your rent was 15, utilities five, mortgage one, total spend 146,000. This is it, this is what you spent. You can't change it, it is what it is. 
Okay, so we start through the calculation. You first of all, we know that you, you, you reduce your wages by more than 25%. That extra amount over 25%, we're assuming in this example is 10,000. So the first thing you need to do is you need to subtract that 10,000 from your total spend to get 136,000. Are we finished? Not yet, because we just took care of the wages. Now we have to ask the question, well, what about headcount? All right, this is where the FTE quotient comes in. So here we're making an assumption that the FTE quotient is 0.75, less than one. Uh-oh, so it's less than one. So the 136 amount is not even good for you. It's gonna go lower. So it's gonna go to 102. That is your modified amount. You compare that to the 120, which is the amount of PPP you got, to the calculation where you're taking your payroll cost, dividing it by 0.60. And guess what? Your forgiveness amount is only 102. Okay? A couple questions, Aida. I did not reduce salary or hourly wages, but still had to use the long form. Does the application easily account for this? Uh, it does, it does, but you still have to go through the application and maybe you didn't reduce the, 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 maybe you didn't reduce the salaries and the wages, but what about if you reduce the headcount? Because if you reduce the headcount, as we just talked about, you go into this whole land of the FTE quotient, which may or may not be one. Okay, if I know that the FTE quotient will be equal to one because the safe harbor is met, do I still need to calculate and compare the FTE for the covered period versus the reference period? Um, you don't have to calculate it versus the reference period, uh, but you still have to go line by line and check the boxes. Okay, thanks. Okay, now we come to the monster of all monsters, the actual application documents, okay? And your bank should be giving you a choice of easy form versus the long form. The actual loan forgiveness calculation sheet is made up of three parts. The first part is the, is the sheet where you, where you go through the calculations and at the bottom of that sheet is your forgiveness amount. However, every single line till you get there is referencing to some schedule or worksheet. There's something called a Schedule A, and there's a worksheet to the Schedule A. All these three components are part of the same document. And you will see that you have to go through every single one of them and make separate calculations, which then transfer from one sheet to the other. But also make sure that you're looking again and again as to the certifications. You cannot imagine how important that is. All right. You also have, uh, this is really nifty. This is a, now you're gonna say I, I must be a real nerd if I'm talking about documentation and I'm using the word nifty. Oh my God, maybe that was a slip of the tongue. But anyway, this is an all encompassing calculation uh, uh, worksheet which gives you all kinds of stuff. It gives you the definitions, it, 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 it separates concepts from concepts. I personally found this one very useful because on its own, it was difficult for me to do the A part of the documents. I needed like a crutch. I needed a go-to place and that was it. So I mentioned Schedule A worksheet, which is really, it's really part of A, but I wanted, I wanted to basically talk about it again. And what is it? It includes calculations for FTE and salary. That's where those are, are from. And it also tests if you meet the safe harbor rules or not. Okay. All right. Now, loan forgiveness application instructions. Also, this is a very helpful one. It goes through a lot of information. It also, um, it includes information as to whether you received EIDL or not. If you received the advance under the EIDL program, that advance by definition will be subtracted from your forgivable amount. Let's keep going. This is an optional form. You don't, you, you, you can choose if you wanna, uh, if you wanna um, go through it or not. And then next slide would be, these are your link to the documents. 
in case you don't have them already. And with that, we come to the end of my part. I just want to remind people, a lot of this information is overwhelming that I just presented. You will receive a copy of the slides, so you can go over it in detail, and you will be receiving a recording of this webinar. So you will receive a sl the slides and a recording of the webinar, so you, can't, you will receive this information and can go over it in detail. We are now going to open it up and finally take your questions. So um, our first question is going to be from Robert Cohen. Which of these qualifies as a business expense vis-a-vis -a, -vis a PPP loan? A business credit card interest? B, monthly payments for remote storage and on-site storage? C, three-in-one cable bill that includes Wi-Fi and telephone? The cable bill certainly qualifies. Um, that's a utility for your business. Um, the storage I would say I have had other people who have this question. Um, if you regularly rent, if you consider that rent, if that's a um, warehouse or something that you regularly, you have a regular obligation that predates February 15th, I would consider it rent and I would include it. Um, it's a gray area. Um, credit card interest definitely does not count. Um, so those are the answers to that. Just one aside, um, Aida and I both have answered, there were, a, thank you all, there were a lot of questions coming in through the Q&A throughout the presentation. Aida and I have answered many of those um, during the times that we weren't speaking. I believe, Kendra, that they'll be able to get that as well, because a lot of them were more general. We, we generally answered them to everyone unless they were very personal. Um, so also you should try to check out the Q&A because a lot of questions were answered during the webinar um, there. And I can, I will send out a copy of the Q&A um, to everyone. So you will receive a copy of the Q&A um, as well as the slides and the webinar. So you will have um, that information. Um, a follow-up to that expense question from Chris. Does liability insurance count as an expense? Not insurance in general is, if it's not um, related to employees, um, does not count as for coverage under PPP spending. Okay, a question from Courtney. I received both the IDLE and the PPP, so I'm lost as to what to do with both. Um, it's sorry if I, I probably confused you, and I apologize for that. Um, you should do everything that we said regarding the PPP. You should keep track of your spending, you should um, file all of the forgiveness documents. Uh, the only thing that's different is if you received an idle um, advance, when you come to the very end of the forgiveness application, you'll be asked to list that and it will be deducted from your forgiveness amount. In terms of how to spend the money, um, what you should do is, again, plan out your spending, spend your payroll, certainly, as much of your payroll as you can uh, using the PPP funds. Um, if you have money left over, allocate some of that to rent or utilities. And then the idle is can be used more generally for operating expenses. So the idle funds used for any rent and utilities that aren't covered by the PPP, you can use it to buy inventory, you can use it to pay vendors, you can use it for all sorts of operational expenses. From Eric, if I submit the EZ form and there's a discrepancy, will I have an opportunity to rectify it? Oh, Carolyn, you're on mute. No, I, I was leaving that one for Aida, but she was on mute. Okay, Aida? Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. I mean, basically, it all depends on your bank and if they've taken that application and forwarded it or not. Uh, they have 60 days, as Carolyn said to forward it to the SBA. So if you catch it and it's within that 60 days, you should talk to your bank and you should talk to them about the discrepancy. And if they agree that that's a correct discrepancy that should be corrected, then you'll have a chance to do it. If you, decide, if you don't catch it until the 60 days are over and it's already with the SBA, I'm not sure what the exact answer is, but I'll take a guess that it'll be difficult. But that is a conversation that you should have with your banker. 
because on the PPP side, it's the bank that's really uh, looking at these applications and then forwarding them to SBA. From Robert, since I have no payroll, no rent, I work from home, or mortgage interest since I have no mortgage on my apartment, if I do receive a PPP, what can I spend it on? You can spend it on, on compensating yourself, basically. And compensating yourself, we discussed throughout the webinar how to do that. It's gonna depend on Schedule C, uh, what you made on a, a per annum basis, and then you're gonna translate that into a weekly amount and multiply that times the coverage period, but it's gonna be capped at the 44,000 odd number. From Mel, do we have to spend 60% of the payroll within eight weeks and does it have to be distributed weekly? Carolyn, you, you want to? Yeah, sorry, I was, I was on mute. Yes. Yeah, you do not, first of all, you don't have to spend it on eight weeks at all. You have 24 weeks, unless you choose eight weeks. Um, you, and you do not necessarily have to distribute it weekly. Um, it just has to be spent during the coverage period or the alternate, or the APCP, the alternate covered period. Another question from Norman. Does it make sense to apply to more than one lender? Yes. You cannot get more than one PPP loan, but especially now that we're coming down to the wire, we generally recommend that you apply multiple places. Um, once your application is accepted by one of them, you should cancel the other applications. Um, given that they all use the same um, process and the same forms, you're not going to do better at one lender versus another. It's just who gets to it quickest. So once one is put into process, you should cancel the other ones, but there is, you should definitely, uh, we, we, we would, we have, there's no harm in going to multiple lenders. Uh, we have a list on our website of online lenders. Sometimes those are quicker than the, um, the regular banks. From Larissa, we're a seasonal business with staffing at annual highs now. Applying for forgiveness could now be very advantageous for us with regard with regards to the FTE aspect. We're at staffing lows for at 12:30 at December 31st. How can I figure out how to act now? I think as long as you are comfortable, I would do a rough calculation and figure out that you've spent the money that your headcount is, you know, look at those different reference periods that, you're, that Aida just explained. If your headcount levels, your FTE levels are the same as they were in the reference period, you've spent the money and you haven't cut anybody's salaries or wages, then you don't have to worry about the safe harbor. Um, and you can apply, um, and you can even apply after, between eight weeks and 24 weeks. There's no restriction as long as your lender will accept the application. You've mentioned several times that keeping um, a separate bank account um, for the PPP funding um, is a great idea. Um, can that separate PPP bank account be a free personal account as opposed to a business account? I, I would suggest not because the PPP money is going towards your business, not towards your own personal finances. So you don't want to mishmash or, or, or basically, uh, you know, you, you have to track the PPP for your business and the expenses for your business. You cannot, uh, or you should not rather, you can, but you shouldn't because then it'll get very confusing for you when you want to calculate and decide which is which. Just one, one addition to that, you know, we've said a couple times that we recommend having a separate account for the PPP funds. It's going to make your life a little easier, but if it's going to cause you expense to open a new account or it's just not worth it to you, it's not the end of the world. As long as you keep good records of what you spent the money for and you can document it, you can do it in a mixed account. It's just going to make it a little easier if it's available to keep it separate. From Michelle, as a sole proprietor and a single employee, am I able to pay myself the entire amount at one time? My PPP was a small amount based on line 31 on Schedule C. Yes, the answer is yes, but it's subject to that limit that we went through. It, you know, whatever, whatever you choose, whether it's the eight week period or the 24 week period, you have different limits, which we discussed and you'll see when you get the slides. And the answer is yes, as long as that amount that you're paying yourself is limited by those caps. 
Stacy asks, is there any advantage to applying early for forgiveness? Um, I'll take that one. The only advantage is if you have a situation where you've already spent the money and you've done everything you're going to do um, and you have not uh, reduced uh, your, your, your headcount or salaries, or if you have, you know that you um, have restored them. So if you, if you qualify already and you've already spent the money, what's the point of waiting? On the other hand, if you do have a situation where you've reduced your headcount or your salaries and wages, um, and you think that by waiting until the end of the year and taking advantage of the 24 week period, you could restore these, these levels, then why do it now? You're, you're basically preventing yourself from taking advantage of, advantage of the safe harbor. Thank you. Um, this is a question that was pre-submitted by Alicia. Per prior guidelines, we budgeted and used all funds in an eight-week period, which entailed laying some people off again after our eight-week period ended post-June 30th. How will the SBA changes affect our forgiveness application, and how will the layoffs affect our forgiveness amount? Being we were previously under the impression that having a full staff on June 30th would allow full forgiveness. Well, here again, all right, this is a question of you have the option of using the eight week period versus the 24 week period. Just because you got the money early doesn't mean you're boxed into the eight weeks. So as I said previously, you look at what you've done. If what you've done qualifies and you can get the full forgiveness amount, then don't wait. But if you, you may not have reduced your head count, but maybe you reduced the wages. So if there's something there that's, that's not forgivable, but can be forgivable, you may as well wait. This is to your advantage that they've now given you the 24 hour, the 24 week period. Chris asks, we received an idle loan amount before we received the bulk of the PPP loan. The person in the organization who applied for that money is no longer with us. I know nothing about the restrictions, if any, on those funds. Is that idle funds in advance on the PPP? And is it always included in the entire amount that needs to be paid back or forgiven? The idle um, is a separate loan. And most, many idols also had what was called an idle advance. It would be um, a couple thousand dollars, an even number, um, based on the number of employees you had of less than $10,000. That idle advance is the only amount that gets deducted from the PPP forgiveness. And then as far as spending the idle, as I explained in the earlier question, you have a much broader leeway with that. You can spend it on other kinds of operational expenses um, besides the very strict regulations on the PPP. From Jeannie, prior to the pandemic, I had a few employees who worked very small amounts of hours weekly, like two to eight. Do I need to consider these employees in the math at all, or do my employees who, or only my employees who, who worked full time? Ida? Say that again one more time. So prior to the pandemic, I had a few employees who worked very small amounts of hours weekly, like two to eight. Um, how do, do I need to consider the employees in the math at all, or only my employees who worked full time? Well, it, de it depends on whether they're, you fit the definition uh, of an employee. Do you give them a W-2 form? It's still, it's still better to have them in there than not to have them in there because it could improve your calculation when you do your FTE and the quotient. If you don't, Sorry, they worked prior to that. They, exactly. Those were people prior. Prior, yeah. So it's better to have them there uh, as long as they're employees and not, and not uh, independent contractors because they will add to that FTE calculation, which will then help you with your FTE quotient. And if you do the calculation and you find out it's minimal and it doesn't make a difference, then you'll see and you, you'll, you'll decide if you want to put them in there or not. It all depends on the calculation. Thank you. Um, Bruce asks, does a business cell phone qualify as a utility? Yes, I'm yes. sorry. Yes, we yes. like an easy one. Um, Michael asks, I received a grant slash loan advance, but never completed the loan process. What do I do? Um, well, 
if you completed the, if you got the advance, your um, application, I don't know how long the applications remain open. Um, there's usually a process to follow up with them to get the full loan. If you're still interested, um, hopefully you have that application number that came with the advance. If you go to the SCORE website um, and you go to the coronavirus funding information, down near the bottom, we have a listing for the hotline that you can call the SBA to check in on any questions on the EIDL loan. And what I would add to that is it is an EIDL loan. This is not a PPP loan. PPP did not have advances, whereas EIDL did. Um, you'd mentioned that um, there had there were some circumstances where if you're in compliance with like OSHA and other regulations, um, Jerry asked, could compliance with public recommendations by Dr. Fauci provide a safe harbor? <laughs> he works for the CDC. The CDC was listed. Okay, thank you. Um, we have an employee, from Chris, we have an employee who received a raise after the referenced period. Would all payroll to that person qualify? Um, as long as it doesn't exceed the cap, as long as, right. you, so you, you got the PPP based on your prior payroll and you had, you know, eight, uh, 10 weeks of that prior payroll. Um, so that's going to limit how much you can spend, but there's no limit on raising employees as long as you didn't raise a salary above $100,000. From Pierre, if I decide to use the PPP as capital to grow my business, when do I need to start repaying the loan at that 1% clip? How long will I have to finish repaying it? Carolyn? Oh, sorry. I was waiting for you. Um, uh, first of all, I mean, you you really are supposed to spend it on those general purposes. Um, so just keep that in mind. Money's fungible uh, and all of that. So try to spend some PPP on, but on other on things on rent, utilities, and paying yourself or paying employees because those are what you're supposed to spend a PPP on. Um, that should free up other money uh, to invest in capital in your business. But if for whatever reason you don't meet the forgiveness requirements and you end up having a loan, uh, the interest will actually accrue from the beginning of the loan. So you are going to owe that 1% interest on whatever amount is not forgiven over the five-year life of the, um, of the loan. You just won't have to start making any payments until that date when the SBA approves the final forgiveness amount. So as we said, you send the application to the bank, the bank has two months to review it, and then they send it to the SBA who has another three months. So it could be anything between zero and five months from when you submit the application. Um, if you really think that you're not going to get a lot um, forgiven, you have this, there's no time limit on when you can submit the forgiveness application. You have to just get it in before the end of that five year maturity period. If you do not submit it by 10 months after your forgiveness period ends, then you will start owing interest on the full amount there. From Ray, I've received a PPP loan based on an eight week period. Can I get additional funds for the remaining 16 weeks of the aforementioned 24 weeks? I'll answer that one. No, what has not changed is, is the amount is basically two and a half times your monthly amount that you put in to your application in the first place. So the extension is only giving you more time to make the spend. It's not changing the basis upon which the spend calculation is made. Sue, which form does an independent contractor 1099, who has next to no overhead expenses use? Well, you're going to use the form C. Well, so say that again. You have no employees, nothing, just you. That's the easy form. Okay, thank you. Um, from Stacy, um, I'm a sole proprietor. My expenses are almost all payroll. Um, I applied in May. It sounds that I would only be forgiven 60% of my payroll versus 75% if I do the two-month period. 
Can you clarify? Hmm. Can you repeat the question? I'm a sole proprietor. My expenses are, all, are almost all payroll. I applied in May. It sounds, that I would, sounds like I would only be forgiven 60% of my payroll versus 75% if I, only, if I do the two month period. Can you clarify? No, that amount should not be, the amount, first of all, when you say 60% of your payroll, it's not 60% of payroll, that's not the calculation. The 60% relates to, to the forgiven amount. So the forgive, if you have nothing other than payroll, and I'm assuming when you say payroll that although you are a sole proprietor, you have employees, because otherwise if you don't have employees, then we're not talking about payroll per se, right? We're talking about you as an independent contractor and the amount that you make uh, on, on Schedule C. So if you look at that, you take that amount basically, and you, you take it and you divide it by 0.60 it's it, to, get, to get to the forgiven amount. So your payroll needs to be 60% of the forgiven amount. That amount does not change whether you had two months within which to, to do it because you chose the eight week period or whether it's the 24 months. Again, the eight and the, and the, and the, the, the coverage periods are only periods during which you can spend and the 24 obviously is a greater amount of, of, of time during which you can. But the periods themselves do not affect the calculation. Just one clarification, because we got a couple questions on this. The 60% is a minimum. You can spend 100% on payroll. There's no limit on payroll. You can spend up to your total PPP on payroll. So if that was the question, don't worry about it. As you can, because uh, we got a couple questions on that. Thank you. From Chris, do we need something signed by the employee as documentation for an employee who refuses to come back? Or is it just a written letter from the organization to that employee? Hmm. Want to take it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's better if you get an acknowledgement signed. So this way there's no dispute about it. If you can't get it, then obviously your letter to that person. But you, you, you need to have some way of showing if they're not signing it that they received it. But in, in an email exchange or a text exchange, you know, you don't necessarily need their actual physical signature on it. Having some kind of, of correspondence is good. Right. Thank you. If the storage, so this goes back to cl a clarification of an earlier question from Bruce. If the storage is, is um, that the storage rent that he's paying is for business files, would that still qualify as a business expense? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Like I said, that's it. I've dealt with this with a couple other applicants and honestly, it's not covered. Um, it's an area where you're gonna have to use some judgment because it, I think when they mean rent, they mean renting an office, renting a space. Um, you know, I've had other, uh, applicants who rented storage facilities for, you know, they were in different industries that required, you know, equipment. Uh, they didn't, they, this, these were people who didn't have an office and so they counted that as their rent. Um, like I said, there is no clarification. It's, it's something that may be clarified. This may be one of the areas where we get more clarification as people start applying. That's what happened with the original PPP application. Right now, I can't give you a firm answer. If you're comfortable applying with it, I would make the application. If your bank, your bank may dismiss it or the SBA may dismiss it. Okay, thanks. Um, from Chris, levels in, um, that was pre-submitted, levels employee is hours and roles. Can we give a part-time employee the hours of a full-time employee that didn't come back? Sure. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. We like a simple one. Um, from Michelle, as a sole proprietor, are there any nuances I should consider as I use the funds for payrolls? And also, is there a time limit by which all the funds have to be used? Yes, I can answer that one. Okay. The time limit by which the funds have to be used is December 31st, 2020. What you need to watch out for is, you know, how you compensate yourself. You don't, you don't want to go over that cap limit 
uh, as, as, as the 44,000 or the 15,000. So if you decide not to give it to employees and to pay it to yourself for whatever the reason is, if, well, obviously if you don't have employees, then that's not an issue. But in either case, you just have to make sure that you're sticking within the cap for that period. If it's, a, if it's the eight week period, it's the roughly 15,000 that you can give yourself. If it's the 24, it's the roughly 44,000. As long as you're within that limit, you're fine. Thanks. From Anya, how do we pay ourselves if we have no payroll? <laughs> well, I can, I can start that one and, and Carolyn, please uh, pitch in. Do self-employed right, right. self individuals have to write a physical check? Okay, so how do you take money out of your business till now? Think about that, right? You have an account, and at the end of the day, you're drawing money out of that account, okay? So you still do the same thing. It's just that the, the actual amount and the cap of it uh, has to be whatever your amount is on your C, on your Schedule C at the end of the year, divide it by, get cal calculated on a weekly basis, and just make sure that the sum total is not more than the cap. So you don't have to have a payroll slip or a W-2 form, but you continue doing what you've always been doing. You must have a trail of taking money out of the business, right? So you just continue doing the same thing. Carolyn, anything else to add? No, I, I totally agree. Um, I, the only thing I've told people when they've asked this question in the past is, if there's a basis that you've used for, uh, absolutely, I agree with Aida, consistency is key. Um, if there's a basis, if you paid yourself a commission based on, you know, deals you closed, if you repaid yourself for expenses, um, try to stick to that same basis. It may be impossible if your business has changed, but yeah, just come up with something that's consistent with what you've done in the past and document it and don't exceed the cap. Thanks. Um, from Jane, as a small business owner, this all sounds a bit confusing in terms of calculations and applications. Will the contact person at the lending institution assist in both, or do I need to hire my bookkeeper or someone else to assist? I just want to be sure I do it right, but of course I don't want to pay out of pocket, ideally. I would not assume that the lender will be of much help. It would be great if they are, and yours may be an exception. That would be wonderful. Um, as I said, this is not a tremendously profitable loan for most banks, and so I would doubt that they're going to expend a lot of personnel on it. I would love to be proven wrong on that. Um, I hear you. We would we really try to help people avoid um, paying for things. So I would just check, one thing that you can do now is check with your bookkeeper now. Uh, make sure that in the course of doing the normal bookkeeping, he or she is recording the information that you're going to need. Um, the rent payments, utility payments, payroll, um, that may get you most of the way there without paying additional amounts. For a lot of things, whether you're you doing this on your own, whether you're using a payroll processor, really try to understand what information is available to you now and start keeping track of that information now without, not only that, that will hopefully help you avoid additional expenses, but it will main, make sure that you're really prepared. You don't have to go back and try to recreate all this stuff six months from now. We've got two more questions that we're going to take and then we're going to wrap up the webinar. Um, is medical insurance or out-of-pocket medical forgiven? Medical insurance or out-of-pocket? Carolyn, you're on mute. Oh, I thought, Aida, you want to take that? I'm not, I'm not sure I understand okay. that. Yeah. I think if you, medical insurance, if it's an employee benefit, yeah. is included. So if you're paying it to your employees or if you're a W-2 employee yourself and it's included in your compensation, then it counts as payroll. If it's a separate um, expense that you pay through the business for yourself, it's not included. And our last Do you question, agree with that, Aida? Yes. Okay. Our last question that we're going to take is from Akila Tomlinson. How do I prove that I use the funds properly? <laughs> I think there's a question a lot of people have. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, let me take a crack at it, and then I, I, I will ask uh, Carolyn to pitch in. 
there are documents. Look at the application and there's a whole slew of documents in the applications that, that ask for you to provide information, okay? So some of those will include calculations and numbers and backup material. So it's not just you certifying that you paid X dollars to somebody. So the documentation process, you should be aware of it from now and you should look, it is, it is included in the applications themselves. A whole list of what is required and what's not. Carolyn, anything to add? No, I think that's exactly right. You know, just to wrap this up though, um, like everything about the PPP, there's a lot of details, uh, but none of this is super, super hard, okay? And that's why there's, I think, two types of people. Um, I fall into one of these myself of like, sometimes if things seem too difficult, I'll keep putting it off. Don't be that person. Um, if you're worried about the PPP, that's the reason we're having this webinar, start early. Look, you know, steal yourself, sit down and look at the application. It's not as bad as you think. Go to the end where um, that uh, Aida mentioned, look at the list of documents that you need. Just get familiar with what you need to do. Start early, collect the documentation. There's a lot of little details, but this is not rocket science. You guys can all do this. Um, just, you know, the earlier you start, the easier it's going to be. Thank you guys. Um, thank you guys for all your questions. I'm sorry we were not able to get to every single one of them. I'm now going to share with you some resources and um, a, some, a way that you can get any additional questions that you had have answered. So with that, if you still have questions, we highly recommend getting the SCORE mentor. Um, Carolyn and Aida are both SCORE mentors. Um, our SCORE mentors work so hard to stay up to date so that they can help mentor you through this process. They provide free one-on-one -on -one business guides. So they work so hard to be able to answer your specific business questions. They're a great, great resource now during this challenging time with coronavirus. And they're also a great resource um, as an ongoing basis. Again, you can ask them specific questions about your business situation. Um, the, at the bottom of the screen is our website, newyorkcity.score.org. This is what our website looks like. Carolyn mentioned several times that um, we have co uh, coronavirus financial resources that we've put together. That's what I've highlighted here. Um, we keep it up to date. We also have um, a funding financial resources newsletter. So um, get on that mailing list if you're not already. If you want to have a mentor, request a video mentor. That button is also on this website. Um, these are functions of the New York City chapter of SCORE. So make sure you're going to newyorkcity.score.org. Right now, due to coronavirus, we're doing all of our mentoring via video and phone. As a follow-up today's session, we're going to send you a copy of this presentation. We're going to send you a webinar recording, and we're going to send you the chat. We're also going to send you a webinar survey, and that is where you can provide feedback on this webinar. What was helpful? What needs improvement? Um, this is very, very useful to us. Um, we take it very seriously, and we make changes based on your feedback. It's also where you can provide suggestions for future webinar topics. Let us know what you need from us. Um, this, you know, this drives what we provide webinars on. So again, take a moment, fill out that webinar survey, let us know how we can serve you better. So with that, I'll just say thank you to Aida and to Carolyn for, you know, taking the time to be with us today. Thanks to all of you for taking the time to be with us today. And with that, thank you and have a great rest of your day, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye.